Hello and welcome everyone. Um, this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. I'm Peter Robinson and today we've got Sriram Kanan on and he's going to talk about his technology eigenlayer. And um, I mean, I can say all sorts of things about it, but Sriram, why don't you introduce yourself and briefly introduce the tech rather than me probably doing a garbled story. I'm sure you'll do a much better job. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it, Peter. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to come speak to you all. Thanks to all of you, you know, David, Frank, and others here for making the time to come to this talk. I'm Sri Ram. I am, um, I've been working on this project called uh, Eigenlayer over the last two years. And my uh, uh, work in the blockchain space, things like consensus protocol, scalability, this goes for over five and a half years. I was uh, a faculty member at the University of Washington, Seattle, where I ran the UW Blockchain Research Lab. I've been on leave from there, uh, building Eigenlayer. Um, my interest in peer-to-peer -peer systems date far back, like my master's and PhD was in peer-to-peer -peer wireless systems, you know, starting from 2006. So that's a brief background of my, um, my interest in this space. I'm very excited to talk to you today about Eigenlayer. Uh, I will just dive into the talk to start with. Sounds okay. good. Are you happy for people to ask questions at any point? Yes, at any point. Like, oh, well, I'll stop for all clarification questions. If there's something much more detailed that we need to take a sidebar, I'll say that and we can do that at the end. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your... All right. Are you able to see the slides? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yes. So... Well, what I'm going to present today is about our uh, like some of the core ideas underneath the uh, project called Eigenlayer. Uh, I, I have uh, 50, 55 minutes. Is that about right, Peter? Um, yeah, or take as long as you like. I mean, if you go for 55 minutes and then people ask questions and then we make it to one and a half hours and, you know, like that's great too. But, yeah, yeah I mean, that sounds like an awesome amount of time. Okay, perfect. Um, Okay, so what, what we're building, I call this a universal marketplace for Ethereum decentralized trust. And um, what am I talking about, right? And I think maybe to set the context, I'll say something about why decentralized trust is the core primitive in blockchain. When you think about whether something is a blockchain solution or not, right? Like, Somebody builds the Uber or social network, or you have Blue Sky, or somebody builds a decentralized AI system or whatever. Now you want to know whether it is, uh, you know, whether we would call it in the field a blockchain solution or not. I think the decision boundary, like, is does it rely on decentralized trust or not? If it relies on decentralized trust, likely we'll call it a blockchain solution. If it doesn't, we're going to likely call it a not blockchain solution. So. The sharp decision boundary between what we call like a crypto or a blockchain solution is it relies on decentralized trust. Okay, so de if decentralized trust is the core raw material of blockchains, of the entire economy underpinning blockchains, let's examine how uh, decentralized trust gets produced and refined and distributed. So you know, I'm, I'm claiming that we're building like a universal marketplace for decentralized trust. And uh, the, uh, you know, a marketplace for decentralized trust is not a new concept in and of itself. And I say here that Ethereum was the first marketplace for decentralized trust. Why am I saying this? And it's, it's somewhat different from the normal view that people take, but really uh, what Ethereum did, so if you, if you zoom back in time and like see what, what the situation was pre-Ethereum, you had this idea of decentralized trust that you can actually, you know, of course, Satoshi in the breakthrough work on Bitcoin basically showed that you can actually create a permissionless system building upon decentralized trust and that use, usage of the network was permissionless. Anybody can come and use the Bitcoin network to do transactions. But in what Ethereum did is by making the programming layer, by making the programming uh, language Turing complete, a general purpose, what it did is really to 
create a new structure for blockchains where applications became modules that can then be tethered on top of a common framework, a common platform. So, uh, so here's the kind of layers of the stack as I see it, like you have the trust network and in Ethereum and it started, it was the proof of work and later after the merge, now it's in the proof of stake. But on top of the trust network, there is some consensus protocol, some way to coordinate actions across individuals. And then you have um, emergent from the distributed consensus is like an ordering of transactions. And then you need an execution environment to actually go execute it. And in the, in the Ethereum case, that was the Ethereum virtual machine, the first general purpose programming environment for blockchains. What it did is it was not just a technical accomplishment at the programming language layer. It really opened up the market structure. What it means is now if I'm building an application, let's take ENS as an example. So if you take ENS as the Ethereum naming system and you know there was you know previously before Ethereum, you know if you wanted to go build a naming service, you had to go build a new blockchain. In fact, some people tried it, you know, there was the famous name coin, which was like Bitcoin, but only useful for, you know, creating, uh, you know, addresses and names. So that, that was the uh, name coin, but that required bootstrapping a new trust network for just that application. It's a huge amount of work. It's a, it's a high bar to go execute. So what Ethereum did is said that there's a common framework, a common programming environment. Now anybody can come and build an app. But the application is basically paying Ethereum, the takers or validators or whoever, for actually providing decentralized trust. So in some sense, what is happening is you have decentralized trust emerge out of the trust network and get passed through the consensus protocol, like the virtual machine. And then there is a market for decentralized trust that anybody can come and consume. Why am I kind of pointing a lot to this market structure is because this enables something absolutely insane, which is that as an application creator, you do not have to be trusted. An application creator does not have to be trusted. They borrow trust from Ethereum and they just innovate on top of it. And this is such an amazing architecture uh, because once you separate who brings trust and who brings innovation, now anybody can be innovative, like, but very few people are trusted. Trust is a huge bottleneck. Like JP Morgan is trusted, I am not trusted. So you're not gonna do a derivative trade with me, you go do it with JP Morgan. Like that's how trust works. Trust is highly centralized. But blockchains, especially this particular architecture of separating who brings trust and who brings innovation, enable many, many more people to come up with all of these things. Some of them were, purely pseudonymous, the founders, we don't know who these founders are, but we can still go trust them. That's pretty amazing that now the barrier to creating innovation bent down massively. Another way of looking at the market economy is that the blockchain is creating trust, right? Decentralized trust, and then selling it to the applications. The applications are buying trust and paying for it, okay? So another way of seeing it is you have decentralized trust emerge here at this like base layer. It's getting refined in terms of, I use this consensus protocol, it's, and then I use this virtual machine. And then now, you know, out of which I can, I can build. So you take like some amorphous concept called decentralized trust, refine it into something very specific, block space, right? There is a certain unit called blocks. Blocks carry like EVM bytecode. There is a gas limit which says how much you know of computation can be packed into it, and then now applications can consume it. So this created and kickstarted the first marketplace for decentralized trust. But it's not decentralized trust which is raw; it is decentralized trust which is distilled through the consensus, through the virtual machine, through the gas limit, and then emerges the block-based market. Okay. The downside of this market structure is that the marketplace is not fully flexible. What do I mean by this? You know, Ethereum has a really interesting consensus protocol, the gas per consensus protocol that many of you here built, but the gas, the consensus protocol has makes certain opinionated choices on how many nodes to handle, how many signatures to handle, how, how fast the block speed should be, what particular consensus algorithm to use and so on. 
And this is nowhere near a solved problem. There is a lot of innovation to be done on figuring out what's the best consensus protocol. So suppose you had a new idea for saying that, oh, I have a consensus protocol where every node doesn't download. Each node doesn't download. Each node yeah, don't worry, I've fixed that. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for you. Um, each node downloads a small amount of data, and but together they all like download enough data, some kind of a interesting consensus protocol. Now you cannot go and or I cannot go and go reprogram Ethereum because that's just kind of out of scope. So what this did is gave rise to a marketplace of new layer ones. Every new layer one comes up with a new consensus protocol, new scaling architecture, all of these things, and then goes and executes on those things. But the hard part is, you know, uh, firstly, each of them have to bootstrap their own trust network. Like if you come up with a new idea for a consensus protocol, you're not just doing an engineering uh, job of figuring out how to build the best consensus protocol. You also have to figure out how to build the best community and how to build the best token of value and all of these other things, which are completely outside scope of a distributed systems engineer. So can we solve this problem? And we kind of approach this as a, possible builder in this space, uh, we were seeing that essentially a protocol like Ethereum uh, is, is like an ocean liner. Like you cannot randomly go and try different things with it. You want to go steady. You want to go take the long haul. You don't want to make abrupt changes. But there is a lot of people, and, and, but, and also importantly, only one consensus protocol can be in the Ethereum native protocol. So you cannot have like 10 consensus protocols and then people try out and then figure out which one's better. So as a kind of protocol builder, uh, my interest was in seeing, is there a low barrier way for people to come and try and play with new kinds of protocols that require distributed trust, which is not supplied right now as an application level uh, you know, program, or I just want to go write a new EVM contract is not enough for me. What can I do? And that's, that's what the problem that we are trying to solve. And the way we solve it is by uh, building this concept we call restaking. Okay, what is restaking? Maybe restaking is even more appropriately called programmable staking. Okay, what are we doing here? If you look at uh, the root of decentralized trust of Ethereum after the merge, Ethereum switched to proof of stake. What is proof of stake? Proof of stake is, I take a bunch of ETH or a bunch of money, like some token of value, and I go and lock it up into a contract. And I tell in the contract, hey, I'm going to abide by the covenants of the protocol, of the Ethereum protocol. I'm going to make the block in this way. I'm going to not sign two blocks with the same block number, whatever set of conditions that make sure that I produce blocks in the right way. I make that covenant. And I say, hey, I'm putting up money to show you that I'm, I'm reasonable, I'm honest. This is very, very important in a pseudonymous economy where you don't know who's gonna run the network. You need to make sure that you have the ability to create both positive and negative incentives for these people. Okay, so that's what's happening. So you go to Ethereum, you restake, so that you stake, right? Like that's what happens normally. Now, so the root of trust of Ethereum is it's coming from staking. I lock up stake and then I'm able to supply my trust. Can we take this concept of staking and then expand it so that it's much, much more programmable? Can I take that 32 ETH and make a promise, not only that I'm validating Ethereum blocks correctly, but also that I'm all validating some other chains blocks correctly or some other service blocks correctly on top of Ethereum? So that's what restaking is. You stake your ETH and then you add on a programmability layer on top where you're making several covenants of what other things you're promising to do with, the, with your validator. I'm going to run the Ethereum node. I'm going to run like this other Oracle or data availability or some other thing. I'm going to run all of these nodes according to the covenants. And, um, and then you go ahead and sign up for any of the services that can then be built on top. So you have the concept called services. So Eigenlayer is a two-sided marketplace. I said it's a trust marketplace. So there should be trust sellers and trust buyers, right? Trust sellers are stakers, right? Stakers have stake and they have node, uh, node operation abilities. They are basically selling trust. Who's buying trust? Anybody uh, who 
uh, who wants to build distributed systems is buying trust, right? So I want to build an Oracle. I want to build a data. I want to build a bridge. I want to build any of these things. Now I go and buy trust from the eigenlayer marketplace. So there is two sides to the marketplace, stakers restake, and then services build on top, and then they consume uh, the trust. So let me get into the mechanics of how restaking works. The way the restaking works is normally when you stake in it. So we have two modes of restaking. One is called liquid restaking, and the other one is called native restaking. I'll explain native restaking first. Native restaking is you stake in Ethereum, you're 30 to ETH, and then you have many, many independent parameters to specify. You can specify who, what the withdrawal credential is, who the fee recipient is, and who the validator public key is. What you do is you set the withdrawal credential. Normally, you would set the withdrawal credential to your own hardware wallet or execution layer address. So that when you withdraw all your money goes to that address, you can go and take it out and do whatever you want on Ethereum with it. Instead, you add one more step into your withdrawal flow. You go to the, uh, I, so you in the eigenlayer system, you create your own like micro contract called an eigen pod, which you kind of control, partially control. Only you can withdraw from that contract. You go to Ethereum and then you set the withdrawal credential to the eigenlayer contracts. To your eigenpod. So, and in, in the eigenpod, there is an address called a pod owner. You set your that to your hardware wallet or whatever. So, what happens is the eigenpod is now controlled by the pod owner, and you have set your withdrawal credentials to the eigenpod. So, in the normal mode, if you didn't do anything, you opt into eigenlayer and you serve a bunch of services, you got your rewards. Now you want to just withdraw your ETH from Ethereum and Eigenlayer. Basically, you go to Ethereum and then to the beacon chain and trigger the withdrawals. Your money goes to the Eigenpod. You control the pod owner address, so which means you can then move the money out. Except if you got slashed in Eigenlayer for some bad service, then a portion of the 32 ETH will not be able to be withdrawn out of the Eigenpod. So that's the basic structure of native restaking. You stake in Ethereum, Set the withdrawal credentials to the eigenlayer contracts. The eigenlayer contracts then lets anybody else then uh, that lets you opt into any other set of services, not one, but any set of services that you want to opt into. And if you violate the covenants of any of those services, you will be liable to lose some amount of ETH based on what your covenant with that service was. So that's the basic structure of the eigenlayer system. Um, I'll just briefly I explain this, and then I think maybe this is a good time to take questions on any of the technical aspects. So anybody who's building a service needs to build two things. They're building an off-chain container and an on-chain smart contract. The off-chain container is something that if you're staking and then if the staker is opting into your service, they have to download that container and run it. Like Think of it like running a get node or a prism node or whatever. So you just download and run it. Uh, in addition to whatever other things you may be doing. And then uh, you there's also a smart contract that the service creator is writing, which is a service contract which talks to the eigenlayer contracts. The service contract specifies who's allowed to register, who, what is the payment, like if you store one gigabyte of data, I'm going to pay you one ETH, or whatever the set of payment condition is. And then the slashing condition may be things like, oh, when if you say you've stored an X amount of data and then somebody randomly triggers a challenge or there is a random challenge protocol and then like a random chunk is solicited, you have to produce it. If you don't produce it within some amount of time, you will get slashed. So there'll be some kind of a covenant on, on each service. So that's the eigenlayer system. For a service builder, they register, they develop a smart contract on which they're specifying all the covenants of the protocol. There's an option container that in the service uh, restakers will download and run. And from the point of view of um, the taker, there's also another concept here called delegation, which is, you know, uh, a staker can delegate, uh, suppose you're a home staker and you want to opt into Eigenlayer, but you don't want to actually take the hassle of running all these services. You could delegate only for your Eigenlayer services, but still be a home staker for Ethereum. Or you might want to run all the services yourself at home and you can still do it. So there is no, Fix a delegation set, it's open and people can uh, participate. Just like Ethereum, there is no in-protocol incentive for delegation, which means if you're delegating to somebody, then 
even though delegation is specified in the eigenlayer contracts, there is no end protocol incentives. There is no assurance that your delegate is going to behave right or not. You should do that based on real world trust on that person. So that's the core concepts around how the eigenlayer system is built. And what I'll do is in the kind of rest of the talk, kind of go over what applications and other things can be built on top of eigenlayer, including something we are building ourselves. So if there are any questions on the core architecture or uh, you know how these pieces interact or anything like that, maybe now is a good time to just address it before we can move on to uh, oh. the other. Frank, yes. Yeah. Over to you, Frank. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so if I understand well, you somehow um, have a mechanism to bridge the stake to some uh, another layer, let's say eigenlayer. And then you have a programmable, uh, let's say, notion of slashing conditions, right? Yeah. So you, you make the slashing conditions that are built in into Ethereum parametric. Yes. So you can redefine your own slashing conditions. Okay. That's right. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying this is a programmable staking layer. So in some sense, essentially, so in Ethereum, you know, um, the, Many of you may know that there are many different slashing conditions. One for if you're, you know, if you sign a Casper block with certain conditions or some other, like there are several conditions for slashing. Uh, if you participate in a sync committee and then you, you produce the wrong thing, you could get slashed and so on. So there is already like overlaying of many different slashing conditions inside the Ethereum protocol. But what this does is makes it completely programmatic for people to opt into new, new families of uh, slashing conditions. So, and, and that's how the trust is potentially transferred. And in terms of like the interaction with Ethereum, Ethereum is kind of like the primary source, like because if you get slashed in Ethereum, like eigenlayer has nothing more to get slashed. So it is always a secondary on the slashing path. So Ethereum is the primary and eigenlayer is a secondary holder of your, let's say slashing position. So always Ethereum will have like the kind of, first steps at slashing and only if you have anything to be withdrawn, I can let can slash you further. But that means that you so you're bridging your stake. So you have less stake on Ethereum to participate in the trust mechanism, right? It is not clear what, whether it is it actually means that you have less stake because you do your ETH is still controlled on, on Ethereum. So when you burn the 32 ETH, your 32 is burnt at Ethereum, not at like eigenlayer, right? So in, in some fundamental sense, still the Ethereum protocol relinquishes control and sends it back to the withdrawal, like Ethereum's holding custody of your 32 ETH. Only when it comes to the withdrawal, like a, which means the Ethereum protocol has cleared you of any misdoings or whatever, like only then like the 32 ETH comes to eigenlayer and only then any, any additional slashing can be enforced. So it is in the case when somebody misbehaves on both Ethereum and Eigenlayer, they will lose their ETH in Ethereum and Eigenlayer will have nothing to slash them for. So, so there's a, Lucky asked um, a few questions in chat, but I think the first one is essentially, do you allow dual or multi-staking? So rather than just Ethereum, some random other token as well. You know, so could I have USDC as a staking token with Eigenlayer? That's right. So the core mechanics is you can basically, so let me just uh, step back and say like what our core design principle is. Our core design principle is we want to push subjective decisions to the edges. In our marketplace, the edges are, stakers are one edge because they're agents, they have agency and control. Eigenlayer wants to be just a protocol. And the ideal like, outcome for Eigenlayer is eventually it becomes a part of the Ethereum protocol or Ethereum upgrades to have some aspect of this kind of like programmable slashing incorporated. But our uh, vision is to make this protocol as less subjective at our layer as possible. So which so when we are so I mentioned earlier that we have like uh, uh, native restaking and liquid restaking. What is liquid restaking? Liquid restaking is you can take a liquid staking token from any liquid staking protocol and then deposit it. Then you can ask like, what is special about a liquid staking token? There's really nothing special about a liquid staking token. 
you can actually take any token, any ERC20 token and then deposit it. So that is the, the thing, but it's up to the service. You know, somebody, some service may say, oh, I hate USDC, like that's no good. That's a centralized like party controlling it. And I don't want to respect anybody restaking USDC or staking USDC as a valid staker. So that's part of the registration condition of the service. So we just push that subjectivity out to the service. Of course, in our own services, we are only like, we're building one service ourselves. In our own service, we only want to use the ETH uh, restaked either natively or using liquid staking because we think this has a lot of like uh, shared security benefits, but other people can do whatever they want on top of it. Okay, yeah, and then they'd have to work out, say, if they were accepting ETH and, I don't know, Matic, say, they'd have to work out the relative value. Yes. Yes. Each, each service needs to specify whether they are baiting them by, like, price or some other, like, relative value, or they say that ETH quorum is a separate quorum, Matic quorum is a separate quorum, I need to get a certificate from the Matic quorum separately, I need to get a certificate from the ETH quorum separately, I need both the certificates in order for a block to be valid. There's just a lot of design parameters around how you can kind of take two different quorums and work with it. Having like a bridge price mechanism is one way, but you don't necessarily need it in all the ways. You could you could have other complex configurations. You okay. could say one quorum is using doing one act one aspect, like for example, the Matic quorum is doing the ordering of transactions because that's subjective and stuff. And then the ETH quorum is only certifying the validity. You could split the modules in various ways. There are just like various ways to slice and dice it and our platforms like entirely flexible across all of these modalities. Yeah. Okay. That's um, super interesting. Um, I'll go through Lecky's other question right now. Um, you know, withdrawal credential could be changed any time. Then it, how could you ensure it points to eigenlayer and not reverting back? Is it through slashing? Um, well, the withdrawal credentials one set cannot be changed. It's like a sacrosanct uh, thing in, uh, as far as I understand, basically when you stake on Ethereum, you set the withdrawal credential. Really the only way, as far as I know, how to change the withdrawal credential is you have to exit your validator position and then we, you know, stake again. Uh, there was a one-time opportunity to change the withdrawal credential for those who stake very early on using what were BLS uh, withdrawal credentials called zero. Big, the, the credentials begin with zero x zero zero. They had a one-time option with the uh, Shanghai Chapella upgrade to go change it, but only once. And they move from like a BLS key to a particular execution address. Yeah. I think withdrawal credential portability is a important topic and. Uh, is something we discuss definitely with the uh, broader Ethereum community. Uh, and there are certain scenarios where it makes sense to allow withdrawal credentials to be changed, but I don't think that's part of the current specifications at all. Yeah, okay. And there's one question from Julius, which <clears throat> I think I think he might have answered already, but how does eigenlayer slashing work? Does it happen only at the point of slasher exit? Yes, uh, it, it only happens at the point of exiting the withdraw, you know, when you withdraw from Ethereum. So this again is relates to a core, core way in which the Ethereum beacon chain works. Right now, to trigger the exit from a, a staking position on Ethereum core, you need to trigger it using the validator public key. So that's mm -hmm. how you, you trigger exits on the Ethereum beacon chain. On Eigenlayer, um, the the way that it works is uh, so you know if you so the slashing can only happen when you trigger the exit so there's no way for us to slash native restaking when you don't exit your position to core host the validator key on uh, on the other side though like there is upcoming proposals for what are called uh, contract triggered withdrawals. So you, whoever holds the withdrawal or withdrawal credential, even if it's an execution layer contract, can send a command saying, I want to eject the validator and that forces the validator to be ejected. This is helpful in a variety of liquid staking and other scenarios. Uh, it is in the roadmap. We don't know when it will hit like the uh, mainnet, but I think that is something we are very interested in is whenever there is a, 
whenever there is a valid uh, withdrawal, uh, smart, smart contract triggered withdrawals, we can actually make our system much better by, um, yeah, by enabling um, the, by enabling the Ethereum, um, uh, the eigenlayer contract to go and trigger the withdrawal. If you got slashed in eigenlayer, you can just go and automatically trigger yeah. it from Ethereum. That sounds good. But so I have one question that I just thought about. So it, say I've done stuff and I've had 32 ETH worth of slashing in eigenlayer, but the money's still in Ethereum and I've been all good. Do I suddenly, I've sort of got nothing at stake on Ethereum now. And I, am I now going to act maliciously on Ethereum or could, you know, do I have the yeah. nothing at stake problem kind yes. of? Yes. So there is a nothing at stake problem there where like if you've already lost all your stake on it, on Eigenlayer, then you cannot like, there's no reason for you to continue doing your Ethereum duties properly. So one way we deal with it is the, so first thing is this is only true till we have a uh, smart contract triggered withdrawals, because if you have smart contract triggered withdrawals, as soon as you're underwater, even like you don't, you don't have to go to like, like zero ETH, even when you go from 32 ETH to like, some number 20 ETH or something, we we just force eject your validator for you, right? So, but that functionality is not available today. So what we do instead is to actually uh, rely on uh, the other thing, which is we, um, we don't slash 32 ETH. We only slash till 16 ETH on the eigenlayer contract. So there's always something at stake. If you, if you don't want to uh, lose both, 16 ETH, you'd better behave on Ethereum. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so we've got sort of three more questions. I'm just wondering whether we should continue with the talk or do the three more qu questions now. What would you prefer? Let's continue with the talk and then I'll come back to the questions. I think we'll have plenty of time at the end. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Peter and Frank, for the questions. Okay, so what, what happens when you have a universal marketplace for decentralized trust is now you have the common framework on Ethereum. Now, basically, Eigenlayer is essentially sitting at the root of trust, which is the close to the staking. And then it lets you supply it flexibly to any other services that can be built on top. So, you know, instead of you know, the Ethereum stake, only securing the Ethereum consensus protocol and virtual machine and so on, you could actually now serve, you know, somebody wants to experiment with a new consensus protocol, a new virtual machine, a new kind of like a data storage protocol, any of these things, you can actually use a common framework to do all of these things. So we permit more innovation for distributed systems builders to come and do on all these different layers rather than only at the uh, smart contract programming layer. Okay, so that's the um, uh, th that's the high level about the protocol. So what I will do is now switch and talk about what are some of the interesting things we can build inside this. Just give me one second. I'll switch to a different slide. All right, here we go. Okay, so, you know, we all know Ethereum's like um, roadmap is primarily a modular uh, layered roadmap. So what it means is in the, you know, uh, we build systems like rollups where rollups do off-chain execution. They move the execution off-chain and then just verify on Ethereum that they did the right thing off chain. So the advantages of a modular roadmap is you don't have any kind of computation and memory footprint of your off chain computation on the Ethereum network because you've moved all of it off chain and just make submitting proofs, whether it is cryptographic or some kind of an interactive fraud proof. Um, these systems inherit the safety and liveness, basically security from Ethereum. 
So these are great advantages and it allows for a lot of execution and computation scaling. But there are still several limitations in this system. The data bandwidth that is available. So whenever you move computation off chain, there is either inputs to the computation or outputs of the computation that you want to publish. Why do you want to publish it? You want to publish it so that other people can verify your computation. You want to publish it so that other people can continue doing your computation after you're gone, so they're not trusting you. So all of, for all of these things, you need to publish the data on Ethereum. So today, the data bandwidth of Ethereum is uh, somewhat low. So you only have 83 kilobytes per second of data. So if you use the entire Ethereum blockchain only for writing data, but not for anything else, still the data bandwidth you get is only 83 kilobytes per second. There is a, um, the other limitation in the existing system is, you know, when you want to finalize that a rollup has returned data to Ethereum, uh, that finality time is actually you have to wait for Ethereum to finalize. And Ethereum's final finalization time is like two epochs, which is like 12 minutes. So the finalization time is slow. And what we're seeing is some new protocols coming up, which are saying that they can get finality in like one second or whatever, like even faster. So, you know, how does the Ethereum rollup landscape compete favorably with these kind of new protocols? The other aspect that we see is we rely on centralized sequencers, like the each of the rollup has a node called a sequencer, which aggregates all the transactions and then makes a computational proof that, that the transactions are correct. But this is a single point uh, failure mode, as well as if you want to, uh, it can engage in censorship and other things in the short time scale, even though at a slow enough time scale, there are ways for a rollup to read data from Ethereum and force include a transaction. Okay, so we need, you know, as we see the landscape, we not only have Ethereum, but also have these other chains. We need to be able to build very high quality bridges to these other chains. And uh, MEV management is of course a major topic. MEV is this concept that arises for maximal extractable value it arises because stakers for participating in Ethereum have a degree of freedom in deciding transaction inclusion. And that leads to certain kinds of freedom for them. And they may be able to profit off of that freedom by saying, I'm gonna let your transaction in, not that other guy's transaction, and I'm gonna order them differently, all of these kind of things. This is called ME. And we wanna manage this uh, carefully. Okay. so. Here's the vision, okay? It's not uh, anywhere near realized, but our vision is basically we can take any one of these limitations and build a layer on top of Ethereum which can just like narrowly address that limitation. And you can build this kind of like a composite where different innovations, some like group of people just work on figuring out how to do the best, um, um, how to scale Ethereum's data bandwidth. And maybe there are many, many teams that come up with this competitive model where they all build different uh, data layers uh, and all of them relying on a similar uh, set of validators and, uh, and stake as Ethereum. So you can actually have many teams try to build like a data availability layer and we can see like which, are, which ones are the best. You can build like, finality layers, you know, where you, you have enough economic stake and you can be sure that, you know, something that, that, that is sent there will not be reverted. Or if you know that if they get reverted, you will, there, some people are going to lose a lot of money. Uh, you can build like a sequencing layer where it's a common layer for decentralized sequencing, just a layer that orders transactions, not for one rollup, but across many, many rollups. You can build bridges on top of like Eigenlayer, which actually address some of these issues. And finally, you can also build kind of MEV management. So this is our vision, like basically take up any, any issue that is happening on Ethereum, go and let the builders in the market come up with solutions which compete with each other. And then some of the best solutions then get internalized back into Ethereum as part of the core protocol upgrade or something like that over a longer time scale. So 
essentially eigenlayer enables this new suite of like solutions to be built on top. Uh, the way we think about it is just like the EIP process lets people come up with new ideas and then we debate and figure out like which ones go into the protocol. This is a more permissionless version where people deploy protocols, only a small fraction of the stakers opt in, the small fraction of users opt in. And as the protocol develops, there may be other protocols, they compete with each other. Some protocols like clearly like much better than the others and those get more adoption and they get vetted and battle tested over several years. And some of those best protocols can then either inspire or inform the Ethereum roadmap itself. So that's kind of the our broader project. Um, okay, so I'll so the one system we are building ourselves is uh, the data availability system. I pointed out that the Ethereum data availability is not that high, eighty three kilobytes per second, and <coughs> There is a roadmap in Ethereum, of course, to upgrade it significantly from 83 kilobytes per second to like 1.3 megabytes per second. This may be like a couple of years out. Uh, this system is called donk sharding, which, um, which basically increases the data bandwidth significantly of uh, Ethereum. The, um, the main thing to note here, I'll skip, several of the other dimensions is what we did is we took donk sharding, the exact same cryptography and the fundamental architecture of donk sharding, and then tried to innovate on engineering architectures around it in terms of how data is distributed, in terms of how uh, different nodes uh, arrive at consensus, what data goes through the peer-to-peer -peer network, what data doesn't go through the peer-to-peer -peer network, all of these dimensions, which, you know, when you're engineering these protocols, very important in terms of how efficient it is. So, and, and being a kind of like a opt-in layer, EigenDA has some freedoms in the, it, that core protocols don't have. Several decisions interlock with each other in, in, in a core protocol upgrade, whereas a opt-in layer can make several decisions which are kind of specific to that layer. And we can actually push the throughput quite a bit, like our uh, system throughput that we can run EigenDA at is at 10 megabytes per second. Uh, and we can do this while requiring each node to actually do very little, uh, as little as each node's uh, node requirements. A node requirement in Ethereum is like roughly you need two megabytes per second. Whereas on EigenDA, we only need each node to have like 0.2 megabytes per second. So it's a very low requirement relative to what you need to run an Ethereum node. So that's the core, uh, that's a core like a protocol. And the way it works is fundamentally by using uh, erasure codes uh, where like a sequencer, when they're committing data to EigenDA, they're basically writing, split the data, erasure code it, no node in the system downloads all the data. Every node downloads only like a sample of the data, but together they have enough samples that even if a majority of the nodes go offline or are malicious, you can still recover all the data. So that is roughly the core architecture of EigenDA. Uh, there's a lot of details about that, which I, I'll not be able to get into, but essentially it's, we think of it as a, an opt-in layer for data availability that Rollups, which cannot pay the high fees of writing data to Ethereum, can use while still being kind of adjacent to Ethereum. So, uh, EigenDA is not a new chain. It, it only does data attestation. So, you can think of it as like a data attestation layer. Like, one of the things that happens with something like EigenLayer is now everybody building a new distributed system can build like very, very simple primitives. They don't have to build everything because, of course, that's the point of modularity. Is each, each person kind of builds a specific module, does it really, really well. And then now you, you put in all these modules together and then you get very good performance. So EigenDA doesn't arrive at consensus, uh, doesn't uh, do a lot of things that a normal protocol has to do because it's tethered to Ethereum. Ethereum does the consensus. We just have these nodes, send a data availability attestation, you collect enough of it, you aggregate a signature, put it on Ethereum. On Ethereum, you just have the hash or a KCG commitment of the data and a signature that the data has been stored from all the EigenDA nodes. And that's enough for like the rollup to make progress. So that this is one example of a service that can be built on top of EigenLayer 
that uh, is very valuable to the Ethereum ecosystem as complementarities to what is being built. You know, when you imagine a universe where we have things like on-chain games, we have things like, you know, complex social networks running on top of Ethereum, uh, you know, one megabytes per second is not enough. So we need more. And uh, and we we believe some of the, I have, you know, good ideas in the system, if it works well and everything, you know, have to be then internalized back to Ethereum so that you get the full trust model. Okay. Um, there is a question. I think it's particularly relevant to IDA. So maybe I'll just uh, answer that here. What are the slashing conditions in IDA? This is a really good question because one of the things with data availability is how do you know that nodes are not, you know, um, storing data? And for this, we again rely on the roadmap of dunk sharding, and there is a particular incentive mechanism in dunk sharding called proof of custody. I think Justin Drake and Dunk Rat Phase uh, came up with different aspects of this. And the core idea of proof of custody is it's a mechanism to check that the nodes are uh, custodying the data. And like the, the simplest way to explain it is. Every time you get a new data item as a EigenDA node, what you need to do is you need to check um, the hash of the data that you're storing, all the data that you're storing, and um, and your own like some private information. And you take the hash of all these things, and if the hash of all these things is uh, is in a certain range, it's uh, it's between zero and some some threshold, then you have to raise your hand up and say. Hey, I uh, I got so this this is called a bomb. Like bomb is basically when the hash of the data items that you're storing and your private uh, randomness is less than some threshold, then you raise your hand and say you got bombed. And um, the uh, if you don't do it, if you don't raise your hand up and say that you got bombed, then you didn't even store the data. You didn't so the Called the lazy validator problem. What if you go subscribing to new and new services on EigenLayer and then do, don't do anything? That's a real worry. So we want to make sure that all the nodes do something. And here, what it does is basically enforces that nodes are um, storing the data and then doing this check. Because if you don't do this check, then you won't raise up your hand and say, I got bombed. And if you didn't say that, then you could get slashed. So that's roughly the mechanism. There's a lot more details to it. This is called, I'll just type it here for those of you who are interested, called Proof of Custody by Justin Drake and Dan Parad based. Okay, so you'll find a good material of, on that on Ethereum research. Okay, moving on. Okay, you can use EigenLayer for things like decentralized sequencing, where you take a bunch of like transactions. There's a group of EigenLayer nodes which have opted in, and then they order transactions across, uh, you know, for many many rollups, and then they supply it back to the rollup. And one of the nice things here is if you think of a rollup, uh, rollup nodes. If you think of what the rollup uh, sequencing nodes' role is, it's doing two different things. One is it's ordering transactions and then it's executing the transaction. The thing is, ordering transaction is a stateless operation, you just order transactions. But executing transaction is a stateful operation, which means you need to know the state of the rollup in order to execute the transaction. You need to hold the state in memory. And there's a major problem when you hold the state in memory, you have this issue called state growth and so on. So part of the reason why we're offloading uh, creating the concept of rollup is that we are offloading all the execution. But what a decentralized sequencing network can do is it can just do one thing, which is ordering of transactions. So you just order the transactions across all these different nodes. And that's all it does. It doesn't understand the semantics of what these transactions mean. That's up to the rollup executioner to do. The, the reason that this split works very well is ordering the transaction is the contentious part. Contentious because 
is non-verifiable. If you ordered all the transactions or you censored some transaction is non-verifiable. It's best to use a decentralized network for it. Whereas execution is deterministic. It's just like if you have a bunch of code, you run through the EVM, you get the same output every time. So execution can be offloaded to the roll-up nodes, whereas you just get a decentralized group of nodes to uh, as decentralized as possible to order transactions. That's that's a sequencing service. We we have a lot of teams interested in building this that we are working with. Okay, so um, the the same idea can be used for for example, you know, I'm a roll up. I want to get a fast finality or a fast confirmation, but I normally like to even so. What happens in a roll up is a roll up basically writes um, the, it stores the data in a data availability layer, it makes a state claim and then sends it to Ethereum. And once it's ordered on Ethereum, you know that, you know, that transaction is going to be in. So as long as you have a off-chain verifier, off-chain uh, node, which can download and run that data, you get, uh, you get a pretty strong notion of finality. But to do this, you need Ethereum to finalize. So that's the thing that I said, it's 12 minutes. Let's say you want to reduce it. What we're seeing a lot of rollups doing is every rollup is coming up with their own me mechanism to restrict the, um, to, to provide fast finality. So instead, what we could do is you have a common layer onto which rollups write uh, state settlement claims and this road, this layer runs like a fast consensus protocol and produces blocks with finality at one second or two seconds or whatever uh, the the interest is. And what you can do is now this layer writes data to Ethereum in this order. If this layer does like a, a forking or whatever, then the consensus nodes in this layer are attributable and they can be slashed on eigenlayer. Basically, they lose their ETH on eigenlayer if they behave badly. The same thing, actually, similar thing holds in sequencing is if you said that, oh, TX1, TX2, TX3, this three transactions is my sequence, but later say, no, no, it's actually TX3, TX2, TX1, then you could get slashed because you're saying two different things, which is objectively attributable that you should only say one thing. Whether you are censoring or not is not attributable, so we don't, uh, we cannot slash for it. So one of the principles underneath eigenlayer slashing is we only slash for attributable faults fully on-chain attributable faults, not for non-attributable faults. Okay, so finally bridges, like let's say you wanna move data from some other chain to Ethereum. The, the one way you can do it in Cosmos, this happens a lot is you run a light client of the other chain and then use that to, to move the state across these different chains. But let's say on Ethereum, you wanna go run a light client for a Cosmos hub or some other protocol then that is very, very expensive on chain, right? Because you have to now write the light client in EVM on Ethereum and execute it, it's pretty expensive stuff. But you can very easily do this off chain, like off chain, I run a light client. And on Ethereum, I just make a claim that I've run the light client and this is my state. Somebody wants to contest it, they can contest it and then like they will check that on Ethereum. So this is a super powerful architecture, bridging, this is something I think we are quite excited about as a, as a possible application. Okay, finally, MEV management. So MEV management is again, like one of those super fundamental things. So on Ethereum layer one, the block proposers have a lot of freedom in how to order transactions. And now what happens is the nodes can then sell uh, the block space or do whatever they want with it. So this leads to this concept of MEV, which is sometimes not favorable to the users. So what we think uh, would be interesting is if the block proposers can make credible commitments on how they order transactions. Let me just give you an example. Suppose you have two decentralized exchanges on Ethereum, Uniswap and SushiSwap. And there's some kind of like a price difference between these two Uniswap and SushiSwap. Then what you could do is you could say that whenever I'm proposing a block, 
the first transaction, I go and find if there is a price difference between Ethereum and uh, so Uniswap and SushiSwap, and then go and equalize that price. This is called an arbitrage. And you can equalize the price and then basically earn some money for doing it. So when you have this kind of an arbitrage, let's say block proposers on Ethereum opt into this particular service and then say that whenever there is this, such an event happens, I will actually go and trigger this like rebalancing transaction. And uh, they make a commitment that they will include it. And this is a, so you can think of this as an event triggered transaction that you can build on top of wagon layer. And if you didn't do this, it is attributable that the block proposer should have done this, but didn't do it. So this lets block proposers make credible commitments for a variety of ordering rules to restake and then basically make credible com commitments of various kinds of rules. This is one example. You can do partial block auctions. You can do, um, you can commit that whenever somebody sends you an encrypted transaction, you sign off on it and say that I will, I promise to include the decrypted transaction in my block and so on. So there's a kind of broad range of commitments that you can make when you are ordering transactions. And I think this is uh, something that's quite interesting in an idea. Okay, so I'll stop with this, but I think the vision that I wanna present here is, um, let me go here. So we look at all the limitations of Ethereum uh, that exist. You know, basically I'm listing anything as a limitation which other chains are using to say that, hey, this is my distinguishing technical feature. What you could do is basically go and build, specifically have permissionless innovation and competition for many, many teams coming and building these interesting features. You could have a world where, you know, rollups have a much stronger, much lower finality time, much higher data bandwidth, proper decentralized sequencing, very uh, high quality light land bridges, modular MEV management. All of these can kind of be uh, some of the most important services can be run on all kinds of nodes around the Ethereum network. Uh, and some of them can be designed with very low uh, operating costs. So the final point, which I think is kind of interesting here is that, you know, any significant technological improvements instead of like going and happening on a new layer, layer one can all happen inside the Ethereum ecosystem where the same stake is used to secure these services. And as these services mature and become useful, they can be internalized back into the core protocol, pretty similar to the layer two roadmap, but just expanding it beyond just proving execution claims. So I, I think I'll stop with that and look forward to taking questions. So thank you for a great talk. Um, yeah, I think we, I think the questions may have been answered, but let's see. So there was, um, in, in the chat there, there was, assume you have 32 ETH of stake, can you restake the 32 ETH for multiple surfaces at the same time? Or does the sum amount staked for each service need to be less than 32 ETH? So. Yeah. Um, so the, the answer to that is, <laughs> how do we decide that, you know, third, uh, is can you restake the 32 ETH across multiple services? Once you stake, once you make a credible commitment into Eigenlayer, you can opt into any number of services, okay? So in terms of the security model that each of the services are getting, there are two kinds of security models. The first model is a shared security model. In a shared security model, when, you know, when a bunch of like stakers are opting into many services and they misbehave across many services, then all the guarantee that you have is that ETH is going to get slashed. You do not have any attributability to the particular service saying, oh, this, this much stake is slashed for you, right? They just got slashed. They just lost their ETH, right? Like and just ETH is burned. Um, but there is another dimension of security we call attributable security. By the way, Ethereum operates in this model, right? Like suppose, you know, you are running Uniswap and many people lost money in Uniswap because of a consensus failure on Ethereum. 
you know, and because of a consensus attack where like nodes attack uh, the block production and produce two competing blocks or whatever. Now, Uniswap doesn't particularly get that Ethereum or like, you know, or OpenSea or somebody else doesn't particularly get that Ethereum. That Ethereum is just burned. There's no attributable security to a particular application. It's just shared security. It's a common pool of security that powers everything. So that's the Ethereum model. But I think, you know, one thing we're very excited about is proposing a change to both the Ethereum model, but also particularly implementing it in the eigenlayer is attributable security. Attributable security is if you have, let's say, just to give some simple numbers, $10 billion of stake, and then there are 10 services. And so there's totally 10 billion slashable. And what you could do is different services, and let's say all of them restake on everything, the $10 billion restake on everything, on, on, on these 10 services. Now, the, the, the shared security says that if any service fails, then you know 10 billion worth of ETH or some fraction of the 10 billion worth of ETH will get slashed because you know, you're going to attribute it and then slash them. But what the attributable security says is my particular service will be able to slash and redistribute it. Redistribute it is the important word. That's the new thing. And of course, you can't redistribute every service. We cannot give the guarantee that they can redistribute the entire 10 billion. Then that's an over promise that we cannot keep to when, when stakers misbehave across all the services, then we will not be able to keep that bargain. So the way we do it is we sell insurance bonds against slashing. So this is inside the protocol. So there's $10 billion of like stake. So we know that all the services together cannot buy more than $10 billion of insurance, slashing insurance bond. And each service pays a premium, like there's a bidding market and all that. And then you know you sell the insurance bond. And some service maybe like Uniswap and they say, I want $5 billion worth of security. So they go and buy that $5 billion out from Eigenlayer, which means now they have, when our slashing happens, we guarantee that, you know, that service will be able to get $5 billion of attributable security. So there's shared security and attributable security. Right now, Eigenlayer and Ethereum are both on the shared security model, but I think the insured Attributable security is a much more interesting model, both for Ethereum and for Eigenlayer, actually. But anyway, so that's the answer to that question of whether you are restaking to many services. And here I want to say that Eigenlayer is a validation platform. It's not a DeFi platform. It is not for using the withdrawal credential to lend or borrow or any of these things. It is purely for validation services. You go and build a service where because the, there is a fundamental difference between the kind of leverage we think about when you're validating versus any other kind of DeFi or financial primitives. Validation is endogenous. The risk is endogenous. If you know you are running a correct validator, if you trust the protocols or you vetted the protocol code, then you know that you will not get slashed if you don't do run malicious code. It's a very, very strong guarantee. So you can run hundreds of services and promise all of them that you're doing the right thing. But if you're doing lending or borrowing or leverage or any of these things, you go and take a 10x leverage or a 100x leverage on a market, even if one of the service fails, even if the market price moves by 1%, then you lose like all your money, right? So the market price of ETH or any other asset is not under your control. Whether you're running your validator node in a malicious manner or not is under your control. So there is a fundamental difference between validation and other kinds of DeFi primitives, and we are only focusing on validation. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah. So there was, I think there's the one at... Um, does the eigenlayer decentralized sequencer tackle the MEV problem or it introduces it since the its sequencing is sent decentralized now? Oh, this is such a great question. I don't think it solves the MEV. So we are not building the decentralized. So just to make it clear, we are not building all these services that I pointed out. Mm -hmm. I, it's just the illustration of what could be built. And it's up to the specification of each service to make sure that how they're handling each of these things that arise in that service. Since we are not building it, there's no concrete answer to it. But we 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 do have um, partners that are building these kinds of services. And 
they are thinking about working with Slashbots and other teams to basically tackle their maybe problem, just like Ethereum itself tackles it. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and there was um, from Harith. Um, hey, Sri Sriram, saw Vitalik's post and your thread in response. How will the protocol decide what use cases are allowed for restaking and what aren't? Or how do you tell which ones may corrupt consensus? Oh, that's a great question. Very timely. Uh, just for like context to the others, Vitalik wrote a post two days back, I think Sunday, uh, on uh, on a topic, I think he called it "Do Not Overload Ethereum Consensus." That was the title of the post, and it, uh, I think, the title was somewhat misleading. Mm -hmm. The whole article was basically "Do Not Overload Ethereum Social Consensus." That is the kind of point of the article. Is basically that when you go build something on top of Ethereum, uh, build it so that it doesn't externalize any kind of untoward risk on, on Ethereum. And particularly, I think what the article is alluding to is don't go build something on Ethereum so that with the assumption that if your thing fails, Ethereum is going to hard fork around your like failed thing. I think it's such a bad principle to, to, to build systems like that. I think it is true for applications built on top. It is true for rollups built on top. It is proof of systems like eigenlayer built on top of Ethereum because we're all sharing this commons and it's kind of important to make sure that what's the bottom. One way I, 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 I think my best summary of it is kind of like banks, right? Go and take excess risk and then they know that the, they, they're big and therefore the government has to bail them out. This encourages excessive risk-taking and bad behavior because if you take risk and you lose money, that's one thing. If you take risk and then like now everybody has to come and bail you out, that's really bad. So yes, so, so Peter is saying no protocol should would assume, but I think the point is no protocol should assume and we don't take <laughs> that and nobody, nobody should. Uh, but I think the question here has some interesting component. It's uh, from Hari that says, how do you tell which ones may corrupt consensus? I think the article, Vitalik's article already alludes to examples and shows the the separating principle, I think, in my view, which we have already adopted over the last like 16 months uh, after talking to EF, we, we had a discussion with the EF researchers in last April, like Dunkrad in particular, and he gave us exactly the same principle that we've already kind of uh, internalized, which is that when you have a slashing condition, make it objective and attributable. Like it's a slashing condition, it's written in code, it's something like concrete, there is no like vague, a vague thing. Like the examples that you see Vitalik gave in the article are things like uh, you have a slashing condition for uh, you slash an Oracle input provider for providing ETH to USD price input if they differ from a majority of the others. If you do things like this, then what if a majority was uh, dishonest and the minority was honest and the minority will get slashed based on the majority input. So there are all these essentially stick to objective slashing conditions. Okay, so the slashing conditions are objective. So that's one of our principles. But when we do that, there's another problem, which is a problem all dApps have to face. The problem is, what if the conditions encoded in the contract don't match what you understand the conditions to be, right? There's a programming bug, there's an underflow, there's an overflow, there is a re-entry in C attack. Like we know like all the attacks in, in, uh, in a, a smart contract platform. <clears throat> so the way we do this is have double buffer. Basically, slashing requires both an objective, attributable smart contract to trigger it. And then there is a what we call a slashing veto committee, which can which has which is one-sided, which can only veto slashings, cannot approve no slashings. But there's a slashing veto committee, which is a kind of committee that can veto slashing, which is a, this is the only subjective part that we put into the protocol. But the way this committee works is there are two tiers of services. Initially, we'll launch with only one tier, but eventually there'll be two tiers of services. One tier of services, anybody can build anything. They're not protected by the slashing veto. Another tier of services is they're onboarded by the slashing veto. And when they onboard through the slashing veto, they're going to do a bunch of checks. And the checks are basically, 
is the slashing condition attributable or is it relying on things like, you know, uh, which may require majority consensus? And that's the main thing. And also, of course, things like, is the slashing contracts audited and all of these standard things. But that's how we onboard services. If, and stakers, if they trust this slashing veto, they, then this veto basically has, uh, you know, a power to basically onboard new services. And this is very important because if there is a power to onboard services, we can guide the ecosystem in the direction which is safe. And of course, anybody is welcome to build other services which is not protected by the slashing veto. But for them, they have to take the additional step of going and convincing the stakers why they are such a good protocol that they don't you know, have to rely on the slashing veto. And so that increases the bar that segregates into two kinds of services, one which is maybe much more risky and many people may not opt into, and another one which is much more better than an understood. So that's our kind of high level uh, answer to that question. So, so for the slashing veto, it, it sounds like, I assume that some sort of essentially multi sig That's correct. So it starts with the slashing veto being uh, um, a particular multi-sig, which basically, you know, comprised of 10, 15, 20, over time, larger number of members. The, the uh, slashing veto is, is, uh, is basically like a multi-sig for the protocol. But over time, we're thinking of introducing much richer models for the slashing veto. Just like in Ethereum, like uh, in the MEV boost architecture, there is a role of something called a relay. Right. And a relay is a doubly trusted party, like a block proposal trusts a relay and a block builder trusts a relay. We can have slashing committees be doubly trusted parties where anybody can create a new slashing veto committee. And only if a staker opts into the slashing veto committee and the service opts into the slashing veto committee, then essentially you would get, uh, you, you'd be able to deal with each other. So that's an example of how we can we can mediate that. Okay, yeah. uh, Frank has hand up. Yeah, but there was a question in the chat before me, so maybe from Kokoli, I think. So I don't want to skip to yeah. the queue. Yeah, so I think we have Coco Lee. Um, can you expand more on restakers participating in as Light's client for bridges? I don't understand the relationship between restakers and people running the Light client. Ah, okay. So suppose you want to bring the some Cosmos chain state, or you know, just for simplicity, let's say Avalanche or something. I want to bring the Avalanche state into Ethereum. So I want to know what the state root of the reason block on Avalanche is on Ethereum. How do we get it? We could, if restakers run light nodes, not of Ethereum, but of Avalanche on, on Eigenlayer, like what they can do is they now are following the blocks of Avalanche and then certifying that, yes, this is the block header that I know and have received and then post it on Ethereum. What will be the slashing condition? The slashing condition would be that if you there'll be an implementation of the Avalanche-like client on Ethereum contracts, which is not run on the normal mode, but if there is um, um, if there is the uh, the thing where that the somebody contests that the restakers did something wrong, then the light client will be run on chain and then executed. Basically, it's the optimistic rollup pattern, but applied to much much broader scope of services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we've done so for those who. Um watch the video you know, this YouTube channel often we've done talks on optimistic bridges and their advantages and disadvantages and yep hey things that can happen um all right over to you Frank yeah so coming back to Vitalik's post for instance uh, uh, tell me if I'm correct and if I understand it well when I read it it looks like uh the programmable slashability conditions, uh, they could be corrupted, they could be buggy and so on, and that could in itself, uh, let's say, undermine the uh, Ethereum consensus protocol. So disclaimer, I'm a formal verification person, so I think this argument doesn't hold up together because this 
implicitly means that we have more trust in the smart contracts we write for other D apps compared to the smart contract that you would write for, uh, let's say, uh, slashing conditions. And I don't see why this would be the case. Uh, if, if it's a smart contract, and again, if it's a runnable, executable on Ethereum, I don't see uh, any argument against doing so. And another thing that I was a bit uh, surprised of was that the situation it describes is basically uh, what's the difference between, uh, let's say, validators or stakers exiting, right? They just disappear from the network. Uh, so it, it would produce exactly the same effect. They would be less stake and, and less validators in the system. So I'd like uh, your, your feedback maybe on these two things, uh, having more trust in uh, some smart contracts than other ones. And it doesn't prevent a situation where anyway validators are going to exit. I agree with both both of the points, but I I would I would not characterize Vitalik's post as talking anything about attributable faults. In fact, I think he's making a nuanced distinction between attributable faults and non-attributable faults. So if it is attributable on-chain slashing contract, then I think there is no worry. But the thing that you that I think he's worried about is things like you rely on a majority of your restaker opinion to slash a minority of the restaker. Then what if the majority is corrupted, then the minority can be like, you know, and if like a lot of normal people lose money, then that will be a big enough of an event that, you know, there'll be pressure to say, oh my God, like, why would you allow this? And then you're a fork Ethereum and so on. So which is what I was alluding to earlier that we only allow like on-chain attributable slashing conditions. For things like you disagree with the majority, you can penalize in the rewards that you give in your service, but not flashing each state. So that is that is the bar that we draw. And um, so I completely agree with both of your uh, characterization that D apps already have exactly the same trust model. If we don't believe in the D apps, then like it's not clear what we are building. So it is, uh, it, but I, I would also, um, be remiss to not mention that it is such a hard security model to build a D app and or a smart contract, right? And, and you know, this is the engineering group, so we all know this, but I'm just stating the obvious again. It's an open source system, so the attacker can read every all portion of our code. The open state system, so the attacker can wait for the absolute worst moment to attack the protocol. It is a um, Open entry system because we have censorship resistance that we pride ourselves on, which means any the attacker is system is equally open to the attacker and a non-attacker. It's an immutable system, which means it's open exit. So once you attack and get your funds, you're free to walk out. Royal carpet for your way out. It is an insanely hard security model to build applications in. So the only principle I have kind of come up for our own like building. You know, we talk about all these security things, but really the thing that I'm worried about is what if there is some like trivial bug in the restaking contracts and then like, you know, somebody just steals the money. Like none of these like crazy complex things, like people have put in money, they just steal the money. And I think the principle that we put in is add a lag between entry and exit. So you cannot exit. So one of the nice things about like staking Staking is a long-term endeavor, unlike a bridge where you're like, oh, just give me my money, I need to run away right now, right? Like, it's not like that. It is, okay, staking, people are staking over long time periods. There is a withdrawal lag. So we enforce like a one-week withdrawal lag, in which time your money is just sitting on an escrow contract. And this allows us like a luxury of time to run monitoring and other things that humans can intervene and like, oh my God, what is going on? We are not, uh, also our first versions of the contracts won't be immutable. They will have community governance, basically community multisigs that have the ability to do instant upgrades. The team multisigs can only do like lagged upgrades. We come up with a model where we kind of try to uh, do as, as reasonable a job as possible in, in the smart contract security, but completely agree that there's no fundamental difference between a smart contract for staking and a smart contract for like DeFi or Uniswap or any other things like that. Okay, so I think we've had an awesome number. Oh, there was one question that needs answering and then I'll, I'll do some final slides, but very quickly. Um, is there a GitHub repo? Is there more information somewhere? 
um, maybe you know, I think Roberta was after more details, and I would have thought go to the source would be the way to go. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will. Uh, I will basically share the GitHub repo here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Brilliant. All right. And I'm going to quickly share some final slides just so everyone's across. So, yep, the merch store is open. We've got a whole stack of talks coming up. Um, next week, I'm going to talk about AI and my endeavors across about half a dozen to a dozen AI tools and what I've been able to do with them um, just solidity code and trying to find bugs in it. Can, can it actually really find bugs and how well does it go and what you can do to actually get it to work better? Um, and then we've got some um, talks on cross-chain. Um, Frank's going to talk about roll-up related stuff, title to be changed as we get closer to it. And I did secure that talk on ERC 6551 um, non-fungible token bound accounts. Um, and there's all the socials stuff. So, um, all right, well, look, Sriram, thank you very much again for uh, coming along and doing this talk. And um, if you were to get your slides together and share them with me in PDF, then I'll be able to include them as a link on this video. And there'll be a lot of people who will appreciate that. So, yeah. Absolutely. I'll do that. All right, great. Look, thank you for your time and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate this. Thank you.